Thank you, Dr. Becker. It's a pleasure to be here again this year. I hope you can see my slides. I wish I was there in person and one of these days I, I will get there um, and hopefully maybe even next year. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about migraine disease management and I'm not going to share with you any real revelations. Uh, there's nothing revolutionary or no rocket science here because Dr. Becker figured this out decades ago when he established the CHAMP program in Calgary. And Cassandra basically gave my presentation this morning with her beautiful and um, somewhat heart-wrenching account of her journey to get where she is today. So I'm gonna actually reinforce much of what Cassandra said and much of what Dr. Becker and his colleagues do at the CHAMP program. These are my disclosures. I've highlighted in red those that are relevant to this presentation. I have consulted with um, a number of the companies and drug manufacturers that have brought forward the new therapeutics because I will mention them briefly. And so I've been involved in the clinical trial design and the analysis and interpretation of the data as well as the publication of the data. So the objectives of this talk is to talk about migraine as a disease, to talk about the risk factors for its progression, the principles of disease management, including the evidence supporting new therapeutics, and give you um, some reflections on uh, what I think the future might hold for people with migraine. So the question is, is migraine a disease? And if you look at the definition for what a disease is, it's a disease is any harmful deviation from the normal structure or function of an organ or an organism that's associated with symptoms and signs and differs from that, from what you'd expect from a physical injury. And that is migraine. Migraine is certainly a deviation from normal structure or function with certain symptoms and signs. And we know that migraine is associated with changes in brain structure and function. We have a plethora now uh, of uh, evidence for this. Imaging studies have shown changes in gray matter volume and cortical thickness and in white matter integrity and in functional connectivity between certain regions of the brain. And functionally speaking, we know now from a number of imaging studies that there is a change in the way a person with migraine, their brain processes information. So there, and electrophysiologically, uh, we've demonstrated changes um, in, in the migraine brain compared to a brain that doesn't have migraine. So there's no question that there are structural and functional changes in the brain, and that this gets progressively worse over time, the longer you live with the disease, and the more frequent and more severe and more disabling your disease is. In fact, you can think of migraine as a trait disorder rather than a state disorder. We used to talk about migraine as having paroxysmal attacks of headache, or, or it was an episodic headache disorder um, where people are normal and their brain is normal in between. And we know now that that is not the case. So rather than a state disorder with episodic attacks, we can think of it as a trait disorder with a persistent alteration in the way in which the brain processes sensory information. And we did a meta-analysis of all of the functional imaging studies, now this is about five years old, that have been done in people with migraine compared to controls. And what you can see in, in these um, illustrations here is that whether we're talking about olfaction or light or pain, the areas in yellow and the areas in blue are areas of the brain that become hyperactivated or deactivated when a person with migraine is processing a smell of uh, light or pain even in the absence of headache, and in particular in the absence of headache. So this is in the interictal state. So the way that a person's brain with migraine processes sensory information, uh, and these are just three, it could be balance, it could be pain elsewhere in the body, is quite different than the way uh, a person without migraine processes sensory information coming into it. So the take-home message here is that migraine, you can think of as more of a trait disorder, disorder that has interictal symptoms that are not related to headache necessarily, and we heard that from Cassandra, as opposed to thinking of this as just an episodic neurological disorder with attacks of head pain in between which the patient and their brain is normal. And so taking that a step further, we see that migraine is often divided up into these four phases of an attack. There's the prodromal phase where people will have symptoms, not the aura phase that we heard from Cassandra, where she may have visual symptoms or sensory symptoms or other neurological symptoms that are reversible, but other more 
nondescript symptoms like cognitive symptoms or sensitivity to light or nausea, for example, that precede the headache by up to 48 hours. Then there's the aura in some people, about a third of people. Then there's the headache phase. And then there's this hung up hangover phase that people will have that may last up to one or two days. But what we don't talk often enough about, I don't think, is this interictal phase, which is present in a substantial proportion of patients. And I think much more common than we actually recognize, as we've heard from Cassandra, who presented with her abdominal pain repeatedly and went undiagnosed. So abdominal pain and neck pain and fatigue and cognitive symptoms and sensitivity to light, all of those symptoms that occur in people with migraine when they're not having a headache is due to this trait disorder in the brain and the way that brain is processing information. And so on the bottom, I showed you the phases of the moon here. We could, the moon is always in the sky. And so think of the moon um, as sort of a migraine brain where it's always processing information a little bit differently. And when there's a full moon, of course, there can be a full blown attack with head pain. Um, but when there's not a full moon, patients may be experiencing symptoms of migraine without the headache. And I'm gonna come back to that later on in this talk. Like most chronic diseases, migraine is on a spectrum. You can have patients with diabetes who lose weight and they can control their disease with diet. And you have others with insulin pumps who have end organ damage. Migraine is no different. It's on a, it, there's a frequency spectrum here. So some people, and especially the people that I see, have pain every waking moment of every single day. They have migraine symptoms continuously. And there are other people who may have five attacks in their lifetime. So chronic migraine are those people who have more than 15 days of symptoms, headache, um, per month for at least three months. And we know that they're significantly more disabled than those who have episodic migraine. But recently, we've shown that people who have eight or more headache days per month are equally as disabled as those with 15 or more days per month. So I see a time in the future where the definition of chronic migraine is going to change because we're leaving a whole lot of patients behind here because they're not able to access certain therapies that are only approved or only available for people with chronic migraine. But as you can see here, two thirds of people with migraine have less than one attack or one symptomatic day or one headache day uh, per, per, per week. So there are a substantial proportion of patients who are less affected, but make no mistake, there's a, a substantial number of people who are severely affected. And largely, that's while well, that has somewhat to do with the environment, it has somewhat to do with genetics as well. And Cassandra's talk touched on a bit of that, but we know that there are over 100 different genes that are associated and increase the risk of migraine. And we now know that the, poly, the higher the polygenic risk score or the more risk alleles that one inherits, the younger they'll develop their disease, the more frequent they'll have attacks, and the more severe and progressive their diseases over time. So if this is a chronic disease, maybe migraine is a preventable disease. And disease management really starts by looking at those who have milder forms of the disease and preventing them from progressing. So we know the annual incidence of chronic migraine is about two and a half percent. So if you take 100 people with episodic migraine and follow them for a year, two and a half to three of them will have chronic migraine at the end of that year. How can we identify those three people who are going to progress? Well, we know that there are risk factors that are not modifiable, such as head trauma, which Dr. Becker just talked to you about, and childhood abuse, for example. But there are modifiable interventions, and it, it behooves us to recognize these in all of our patients, including those who have already progressed, but especially in those um, who are in your office complaining of more severe or more frequent attacks. And I believe if we manage these risk factors appropriately and pay attention to them, we can decrease the risk of progression and certainly decrease the burden and e even perhaps increase the rates of remission. So identifying those at risk for disease progression, I think is really important and something that doesn't get a lot of play or attention in this field at the moment. How about the biology of progression? Let me simplify this by saying, you know, we have an ascending pain system, of course, the spinal thalamic or the trigeminal thalamic uh, pathways. And then we have a descending system that modulates pain. We have both a descending inhibitory system. I tell patients it's like a brake pedal. Um, and then we have a descending facilitation or facilitatory system. I, I tell patients it's like a gas pedal, right? So if you want to stop the car, you need to press the brake, brake and take your foot off the accelerator. Think of, think of pain modulation in the same way. 
So we have an afferent system, right? Um, we have the trigeminal sensory system, mainly the first division that transmits pain impulses into the brain. And then we have um, a two-way system that either inhibits or facilitates that. And so you can think of the biology of migraine really as either an increase in afferent input, so an increase in traffic into the system, or decreased descending inhibition, which we heard from Dr. Becker may be at play in patients with post-traumatic headache, or increased descending facilitation. So I'll tell you one of the most common risk factors, for example, of chronic migraine is acute medication overuse uh, or the frequent use of acute medicines. What do acute medicines do? They increase afferent traffic by increasing the production, the synthesis and release of nitric oxide, of calcitonin gene-related peptide, for example. So they increase afferent activity and medication overuse actually disrupts the normal descending inhibition, what we call conditioned pain modulation in the brain. So it's a combination uh, of events in the brain that underlies why pain becomes more frequent and chronic over time. The hypothalamus is now thought to be a generator of migraine and indeed a, a mediator of chronic migraine. It is sort of grand central station when it comes to descending pain modulation systems. So we know, for example, that the anterior hypothalamus has been identified not only as an area, the first area of activation during a migraine attack, but in people with chronic migraine who have symptoms almost all the time, it, there's persistent activation in this area of the hypothalamus. And you can see that compared to controls and compared to episodic migraine patients. The hypothalamus then therefore may also be a target and a biomarker for response to treatment. So this was a paper published last year. Patients were divided into two groups, those who responded to arenumab, those who didn't respond to arenumab. And the one difference between the two was that there was deactivation, as you can see here, in the hypothalamus in people who responded to arenumab compared to those who didn't. Those who didn't had persistent activation in that area of the hypothalamus. So this appears to be a biomarker for response to treatment. Why some people don't respond and why some people don't deactivate this area and now is, is, a, is a focus for future research. Let's take that one step further. Stress. How is the hypothalamus involved and, and do we have other targets in the hypothalamus? And indeed, we do. So stress, as you know, is a very common trigger for migraine attacks. Of course, it's a common trigger and it's a common feature of many functional pain syndromes from fibromyalgia to irritable bowel syndrome and so on. It is a prodromal feature of a migraine attack. It is a risk factor for progression. And it's part um, of many comorbid diseases that people with migraine have, such as anxiety and depression and bipolar disorder. And the molecular biology of stress is now being really kind of worked out and dissected. We know that the hypothalamus releases CRH during stress. We also know now that it releases something called dynorphin, particularly in the amygdala, but also in the hypothalamus. And dynorphin binds to receptors called kappa opioid receptors in the hypothalamus. And what happens when that happens? There is this activation of this descending facilitation system in the brain. So pain is, a, is allowed to ascend, if you will. So stress releases dynorphin, binds to kappa opioid receptors in the hypothalamus, and causes descending pain facilitation. What if you block these kappa opioid receptors? Well, in a preclinical animal model here that we have, we did that in, and showed that this kappa opioid receptor antagonist, some of which now are commercially available, not for migraine, but for other disorders, may be a new class of therapeutics for migraine prevention. And not only that, but it may be a new class for the prevention of pain and other functional pain syndromes, particularly where stress is a prominent feature uh, of the pain. So knowing the anatomy of pain uh, and the anatomy of disease and dissecting the molecular basis of that can lead and tee up new therapeutic targets for the future. So a chronic disease management model is really an organized, proactive, multi-component, patient-centered approach, um, which the CHAMP program uh, beautifully illustrates. And I think of this, I, I need a mnemonic to remember things because I'm a simple guy, but you, know, you need to use your brain when managing people with migraines. So 
The B stands for biobehavioral therapy, biofeedback, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy are all tools that we use. And I know the CHAMP program uses because there's level A evidence for all of them. The R is for risk factor modification, which I spoke about, and lifestyle, diet, sleep, and exercise, which, which uh, Cassandra talked about. And I'm going to just mention here briefly. A is for adjunctive or nutraceutical and neurostimulation modalities, which can be helpful. Injectable, or I is for injection, injectable therapies, like on a botulinum toxin type A, like extracranial nerve blocks, like trigger point injections. The N is for neuropharmacology, and I'm just going to say some, a few words briefly about new therapeutics. And the S is for support and education. And nowhere, I mean, Cassandra did a beautiful job of talking about how important it was for her to be educated and for clinicians to show empathy, compassion, and to support her because, in her words, it, was, it changed her life. So we heard uh, about diet from Cassandra. Avoiding, identifying and avoiding potential dietary triggers. And these are the most important culprits, not in every patient and not even in every attack in an individual patient, but for some, they may be particularly provocative, provocative and so it helps to identify and, and eliminate those. Sometimes you choose a diet based on the comorbid condition with a migraine type. So obesity, a low carbohydrate or low glycemic index diet, histamine intolerance, Histamine is contained in alcohol, alcoholic or fermented beverages, fermented foods, uh, processed meats, um, avocados, you name it. So if you have histamine intolerance, then avoid foods that contain histamine and so on. But one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is this recent publication in a very rigorous study that showed the benefit of a high omega-3 and low omega-6 diet. So this was published just a few months ago in the British Medical Journal. They called it an H3L6 diet. Um, and it was designed to increase the amount of omega-3s to more than 1.5 gram per day. Omega-3s, of course, are found in fatty fish and walnuts and other foods, and concurrently decrease the amount of omega-6s to less than 1.8% of the energy in the diet. And the reason that's important is that when you, the metabolites of omega-3s and omega-6s are oxylipins, they're called, and the metabolites of omega-3s actually inhibit Prane's transmission, whereas the oxylipins produced from linoleic acid and omega-6 fatty acids actually activate sensory afferents. And so in this very rigorous study, they basically showed that an H3L6 diet actually significantly reduced migraine frequency and migraine intensity. So we have an evidence-based diet um, that we should be thinking about for, for our patients. It's better for them and their overall health, and it's better for their migraine. That's why having a dietitian involved in your program can be very helpful. I neither have the time nor the expertise to go through um, a diet plan or a meal plan with a patient. It takes a, it takes a village, it takes a team, and that's the whole point behind this multidisciplinary uh, concept. Exercise. We heard from Cassandra, exercise changed her life. There's as much evidence now, or at least an emerging body of evidence, that exercise is as effective as many of the drugs that we use. So 150 to 30 minutes of ex moderate ex intensity exercise, or up to 150 minutes of vigorous intense, vigorously intense aerobic physical activity can be very helpful. Not only that, but it reduces one of the most important risk factors for migraine prevention, which is obesity. So it's not only better for one's overall health, but it reduces the risk factors for progression and decreases migraine frequency. And sleep. Migraine is comorbid with all major sleep disorders, from insomnia to sleep-related breathing disorders to sleep-related movement disorders like restless leg syndrome. So if you don't evaluate someone's sleep when you're seeing them for a primary headache disorder, and in this case, migraine, you're doing the patient a disservice. So sleep hygiene is very important, but understanding or getting down to the bottom of whether they have a comorbid sleep disorder, sending them to a sleep specialist or trying to manage it on your own, I think is very important. The reason why it's so comorbid is because many of the areas in the brain that govern sleep also govern pain transmission in general and are involved in the biology of migraine in particular. The A, remember the A uh, in my mnemonic is adjunctive. So nutraceuticals, 
We hear a lot about CoQ10 and vitamin B2 and magnesium, but there are other nutraceuticals that have controlled evidence for their use in migraine. And so why not apply them? Because if one of them reduces the frequency by 30%, um, then why not combine all of them? Uh, because it's better for their health overall and better for migraine frequency. Neurostimulation, I certainly use them. There's a problem with access. Uh, they're expensive, but when you can get a patient access to these, they can be really helpful either for as an adjunct to acute treatment or indeed on a daily basis as a preventive therapy. Botulinum toxin we know is approved for chronic migraine can be helpful in two thirds of those patients. Extracranial nerve blocks, trigger point injections, there's certainly uh, uh, enough evidence now for nerve blocks. And then neuropharmacology. I'm not going to go through all of the neuropharmacology of migraine, but um, of course it's, it's of interest that seven new drugs targeting the CGRP pathway, which is unquestionably involved in migraine pathogenesis, have now been approved, at least in the United States over the past three years. Four of them are monoclonal antibodies, three of which target the peptide, one of which targets the receptor, and three small molecules or GPANs, which are oral drugs, as opposed to these large biologics that are injected, have been now approved for either the acute or the preventive treatment of migraine. Basically, about half of the patients in clinical trials have a greater than 50% reduction in migraine frequency with these CGRP monoclonal antibodies, and about a third have a greater than 75% reduction in migraine. With chronic migraine, the response rates may be a little blunted, but according to the real world evidence, about half of the patients with chronic migraine even have a 50% reduction. So these drugs are, no, are unquestionably an advance. They're effective. Um, they're overall generally well tolerated, um, but of course they don't work in everybody. From a side effect profile, similar to placebo, about 2.5% of patients in clinical trials discontinue the use of these antibodies due to an adverse event. That I believe is real take home message from the clinical trials. From an efficacy standpoint, when you compare it to commonly used um, therapeutics, like for example, uh, monoclonal antibodies compared to tupiramate. Tupiramate is the most commonly used oral preventive in the United States. Efficacy, if you look at number needed to treat from a number of meta-analyses, is the same. So the effectiveness is actually the same. But the number needed to harm or the number of patients you need to treat to have one discontinue the therapy because of an adverse event is substantially different. And that's why the conclusion of this meta-analysis was that patients treated with a MAB, CGRP MAB, are about 20 times more likely to be helped compared to tupiramate because they're far less likely to discontinue due to an adverse event. And this was confirmed in a recent head-to-head -head trial. It's one thing to look at a meta-analysis, but it's another thing to actually put these therapies head-to-head. -head. And in this particular example, arenumab was put head-to-head -head in a double-blind, double-dummy placebo-controlled uh, experiment. The responder rate was 55 to 31 percent, and the discontinuation rate due to adverse events was 39 compared to 11 percent. Again, basically reinforcing and confirming what we already see in practice and what we've seen from clinical trials. So from a real-world evidence perspe perspective, how do these drugs perform? Well, they're similarly effective in practice, even if patients have failed other preventive medications, which they have to to get access, even in those with medication overuse, and even in those with significant comorbidity or what's been referred to as refractory migraine, where they failed six or more preventive medications. So again, about half of the people have a greater than 50% reduction. They have a fast onset of effect, sometimes within a day to a week, but we generally recommend three injections uh, to, because some patients have a delayed response. They can be used safely with other preventive medications because they're biologics, they're proteins, they're metabolized like other proteins. And so they don't compete for binding sites and they don't, uh, they're not metabolized in the liver. Their effectiveness can increase over time. And there's a study that looked out at five years following patients. And unlike other drugs, actually, the longer you stay on it, the more beneficial it can be. So responder rates out at five years for those who stuck with the medicine um, is around 75%. And you may switch successfully if one isn't effective or tolerated. And we've certainly sensed this in practice. And a recent uh, report was uh, presented at the International Headache Congress uh, last month, showing that if you switch a patient from one antibody to another, about a third of the time, your 
you're more you're likely to get a response where you didn't with the first one. So that's good news for patients. However, from a real world experience, new side effects have emerged. A higher rate of known side effects has emerged. So one to three percent in clinical trials had constipation with arenumab. It's now nine to forty three percent in the real world. The benefit may wear off before the next dose, and we've certainly seen that. And the benefit, unfortunately, may wear off over time where a patient that's been getting a good response um, can lose that effectiveness over time. And that's unfortunate. And whether that's due to the emergence of neutralizing antibodies, it's, it's unclear. We have no biomarkers who's going to be, that's going to be able to predict who's going to respond or tolerate them. And as I said, there are some certainly pure non-responders to all of them. We've tried all four monoclonal antibodies in some patients, and they've failed to respond to any of them. The FDA has issued a, a label update for arenumab with regard to anaphylaxis, hypertension, which usually occur, occurs after the first injection and usually within the first week, uh, but you need to watch for that, especially in patients who have hypertension, and severe constipation, sometimes requiring hospitalization and surgery. You have to wait five months before, because we treat a lot of women uh, in their years where they have childbearing potential. So you need to have a family planning talk with uh, young women who you're putting on these monoclonal antibodies because you have to be off the drug for five half-lives. And since their half-life is a month, you need to be off for five months before trying to conceive. I did want to bring this to your attention. And that is that <clears throat> in patients with vasospastic disease, <clears throat> including Raynaud's phenomena, you need to be careful when you're putting them on these antibodies because these antibodies and drugs that block CGRP block a potent vasodilator. So in patients with Raynaud's, for example, who might rely on CGRP to dilate small blood vessels in their hands, for example, um, it could lead to complications. And this was a, a report in JAMA that looked at nine patients who developed microvascular complications, including worsening of Raynaud's phenomena, some of whom required digital, uh, distal digit amputation due to autonecrosis. So beware in patients with Prince Metals angina, in patients with a history of ischemic colitis, in patients with Raynaud's phenomena, before you put these patients on a CGRP pathway inhibitor. GPANs now have been uh, shown to be effective for prevention. Remegipant and Atogipant, now both available for prevention, at least here in the United States, can be effective for prevention. And so for some people, rather than injecting an antibody once a month or once a quarter, um, taking an oral medicine once a day, or in the case of remegipant, once every other day, the responder rates look very similar to the antibodies, in, in fact. So GPANS now is another small molecule class of drug just recently approved for prevention, uh, which can be very helpful in some patients. And we're just now starting to prescribe atogipan because it was just approved a couple of weeks ago. In the future, Early intervention is going to be really important. We talk about early intervention in the course of an attack by having patients treat at the earliest onset when they develop pain. I think in the future, we're going to be helping patients recognize their prodrome because most patients have one and treating during the prodrome. There's now a placebo controlled trial with one of these G-pants because G-pants don't cause medication overuse headache. So unlike treating with an opioid or an analgesic or triptan where their overuse can lead to more headache. The use of a G-Pant, actually, the more you use it, the less frequent your headaches will become. So using G-Pants, for example, now that we have a class of drug that can be used during the prodrome, perhaps treating during the prodrome will prevent the headache from even developing and the attack from progressing. So I think in the future, early intervention is going to mean something different when treating during the course of an attack and during the course of the disease. So you know, not waiting for patients to have high frequency episodic or chronic migraine before initiating a preventive treatment. And that takes me to this slide, which is about rethinking prevention and how we measure success. Forever in the field of migraine, we've only measured success by the start and the stop of headache. How many headache days do you have per month? So if you look at this person's diary, they have four migraine days per month. But going back to what I said earlier, Think about all those patients who have indirectal symptoms. And now when you ask the patient or assess the patient for how many migraine symptom days they have in a month, their diary looks quite different. So maybe we should be rethinking prevention and not just base the starting of a preventive based on the number of headache days and measuring headache days as a measure of success, but measuring not only a reduction in headache, 
but also a reduction in overall migraine symptom burden. So going forward, I think we need to be starting to rethink both how we win and how we initiate preventive treatment and how we measure its success. I think in the future, we're going to be looking at rational combinations of, of treatment, particularly in patients who have chronic disease or high frequency episodic disease. So for example, we now have numerous reports that botulinum toxin, which inhibits the release of CGRP from A fibers in the trigeminal nerve, and GPANs or monoclonal antibodies that block the peptide after it's released or block it from binding to its receptor on A delta fibers, may have a synergy, may, there may be synergy there. So the rational combination of drugs, which work on different pain fibers out in the periphery, because we know that these drugs principally work in the periphery to control a disease that's generated centrally. So the rational combination of drugs that you have different mechanisms of action and that work in the periphery may be a solution for some patients who have more challenging disease. In terms of future targets, given that we're now working in the periphery, and given that we're no longer interested in the blood vessel per se, um, there are a lot of new targets available. And so the pipeline looks very rich. Of course, we have these new CGRP therapeutics, but just look at the number of new targets that we're, we now have available based on an enhanced understanding of the biology. The future looks very bright indeed. So that in the future, I predict a future where we're going to be personalizing care, where patients won't have to climb this ladder and step over each of these nonspecific therapies that may not be in their best interest and may not even be on label for the disease that they have, only to get to a disease-specific therapy um, where we have a better chance of getting the right therapy uh, at, the first, at, at the first pass. So today, we have this step care approach. Uh, in the future, we're going to have a much more personalized approach where we're going to get we're going to get treatment right uh, at the outset for patients, and hopefully, in the future, we'll have biomarkers where we'll even be able to have precision care in this field, because a better understanding of the biology will lead to growth in this field. There are more people coming into it, both scientists and clinicians. It will eliminate the stigma that Cassandra talked about uh, so passionately. It will lead to new advances in disease-specific treatment. As I showed you, a better understanding of biology has led to a plethora of new targets now. And ultimately, it will improve access to patients so that you know, insurance providers don't get in the way and don't get between uh, the patient and the physician, uh, because that should hold primacy. And we should be able to have a dialogue with our patients and be able to initiate the, the right treatment for the patient that we think is best for that patient from the outset. Thank you very much for your attention.